Hi everybody, welcome to our special edition Thrive Tribe & Co webinar for July 2019. My name is Sandy Golder and I'm the founder of Thrive Tribe & Co and today we have two beautiful guests that I'm so excited to introduce you to. So this webinar will go a little bit longer than our normal half an hour. Um, and just for those people who aren't our Inner Circle members, these are what we do every month for our Inner Circle membership. Um, it's part of our wellness program that we want run with them. So you guys are getting like a sneak peek special access today and there's no better day to do it because we have um, Cheryl, the sleep coach, and we've got Brittany who is a nutritionist and I'm going to introduce you to both of them today. So we're so excited you could join us whether you're live or on uh, playback recording. So. First up today, um, we're going to talk to Brittany. So you're going to notice that the themes today revolve around um, stress and sleep. And we know that these two, uh, I suppose, topics are something that us mums um, and parents have to deal with constantly. And they seem to come up in our page all the time as being um, points of you know, pain for people. So I thought that this would be a great couple of topics to talk about today. So Brittany is um, an accredited nutritionist and herbalist, and um, she has eight years experience. She's also a mum of two. So she's really passionate about gut health and immune conditions. And today she's gonna talk to us a bit about nutrition and how we can use nutrition to really support our body's stress responses. So Britt, I'd love to open the line up to you. Yeah, thanks so much, Sandy. So um, as you mentioned, I'm a mum of two, but I also have a child on the spectrum. So I'm you know, very experienced in the day-to-day -day stresses of being a parent with a child with um, additional needs. So yeah, I um, consult, um, that's primarily what I do is I consult one-on-one -on -one with people um, in my clinic in Sydney. Um, and I also work with a bunch of charities like Autism Awareness and the Mind Foundation and now Thrive Tribe & Co, Yay. which is great. Yeah. <laughs> so why don't you tell us a bit about how you got into like nutrition and, and the whole herbal herbalist type scene? Yeah, so um, it first came to my interest when I was a teenager. I had terrible digestive issues. Um, I was about about 13 or 14 and my mum took me to a gastroenterologist and they you know did all the tests and the colonoscopies and stuff couldn't figure out what was wrong with me um so then mum got out the yellow pages and was like right I'm going to take you to see a naturopath and she took me to see this naturopath and I just remember looking at this woman and going wow this is what I want to do I want to have all the quirky potions and I want to you know work with food and um, from that moment on I knew that's what I wanted to do um, so it's been a grad you know a gradual process yeah. um, getting my qualifications I'm still studying I'm now doing my master's in human nutrition so um, yeah it's always been an area I've been interested in and then obviously having kids um, went on studied pediatric nutrition at Monash University um, having a child on the spectrum I've kind of like shifted you know my studies that way as well trying to help um help him help my family help other people that we've met along the way as well so yeah, yeah. totally and i think um the thing with nutrition is that it's like we're all lifelong learners really like the new research comes out there's new things they find with food and we can always learn something different so it's such an evolving um industry but it's almost like we're gravitating back to the things that you know, 50, 60 years ago, they were already doing and somehow we've yeah. moved away from that. Yeah, we've got lost along the way. Mm, totally. So um, what what does health mean to you as not only a mum, but as a nutritionist? Yeah, so interestingly, health to me isn't just about nutrition or isn't just about food. I kind of think of it as four pillars of health. Um, the first one being stress. So without, with too much stress, none of, none of the, um, you know, components of health come together. So my, my priority goes stress, sleep, nutrition, and movement. So without mm. all of those pillars working together, um, you know, I find a lot of people have imbalances and things just don't work properly. If you're not sleeping, you can't make good nutrition choices. If you're stressed, you can't make good nutrition choices or, um, you know, divvy up your time so you allow time for movement. Um, yeah. So, yeah, they're my four pillars. Um, yeah, and oh, stress. Um, it comes into nutrition as well a lot 
when I see it in digestion. Yeah. A lot of people are suffering from low stomach acid. Um, they're constipated, whether it's a child or an adult, I'm seeing it in both. Um, basically when you're stressed, your digestive system shuts down. When you're being chased by that saber tooth tiger, um, and you're in that fight or flight mode, um, you don't need, you don't need to digest. You need to be able to think and have blood rushing to your muscles. Yeah. But what's happening in modern society is that we are in this you know, fight or flight, high stress mode all the time. And we're never getting that, that mechanism shut off. So yeah, I really do find we're chronically stressed. My, uh, my inner circle member is going to be going like this because I talk about this concept constantly. And like, you know, <laughs> like your, your blood needs to go to your arms and your legs so you can run or fight. Like it's not, it's not where it needs to be. So it's so important to be able to support your body's stress responses so all of that can work properly and you can absorb what you need right um so in our group we've got lots of busy busy parents who you know there's never enough time in the day so what are some simple tips that you've got that might be able to help our parents you know eat healthier but also reduce stress yep so meal prep is one that i often recommend but it doesn't suit everyone so some people, you know, as soon as I say meal prep, some people go, oh my God, like the last thing, <laughs> I, the worst thing I can think of, think of doing is meal prep. And for some people that's stressful, but for some people it's beneficial. Mm. For some people they like to just do it, get it over and done with once a week, chop up a whole heap of veg, grill some proteins, boil some eggs and just have it there to grab. So if meal prep suits you and it doesn't add extra stress or isn't seen as another chore or another thing you have to do. Um, that's one of my, you know, little tips. Um, also breaking down the, um, you know, nutritional foundations in really simply put, basically your every meal, making sure you have four simple components. And those four components are a palm sized portion of protein, half your plate being green leafy vegetables or low starch vegetables. Um, having a small portion of a complex carbohydrate, so some sprouted grain bread or some brown rice, some quinoa if you're gluten-free, some buckwheat um, pasta. It's kind of endless. That complex carbs could also be legume and other amount of a healthy fat. Um, so that could be an avocado, half an avocado or some olive oil um or even you know um yeah some nuts nuts and seeds as well count as healthy fat so to take all the guesswork and all the over complication of what you should be eating out of it i always just think about those four components um and protein in particular is one to really focus on particularly if you are stressed um it balances blood sugar levels and oftentimes it can, well it does contain the a lot of the amino acid precursors that we need for our neurotransmitters so our um serotonin for example um uh we need the amino acid um precursors to make serotonin um and lots of other neurotransmitters um another tip i often um tell people is just to have snacks in their in their bag either in the glove box of their car or their bag so when you do have a hunger prang um and you're you know rushing to school that you have something um on hand and for me the best thing is nuts like a nut and seed trail mix because it's easy to grab a handful of nuts every day will give you your um, mineral requirement for the day so your minerals including magnesium and zinc and lots and lots of other minerals um, and again they're packed full of protein so they're going to keep you you know it's going to give you um stable blood glucose levels um when we're under a lot of stress we often um deplete our magnesium stores so either focusing on magnesium rich foods which are these nuts and seeds green leafies um, which would hopefully be appearing in your balanced plate or your balanced meal that we spoke about um otherwise things like epsom salt bars are really good um or supplementing with a magnesium and i quite like um a magnesium supplement at night um there's a i won't mention any brands but there are some available that are literally magnesium night and i find these the best because they also help you to have a really 
restful sleep. Yeah, restful mm. sleep, yeah. which, you know, brings us back to those four pillars, you know, where it all sort of starts to come together. Totally. And then, yeah, ultimately it just comes down to eating real foods. Um, when we eat real foods, it's not overcomplicated. We're not having to read labels. We're not having to stress about ingredients lists and numbers that we don't know what it means. Um, so just eating foods that are, you know, the closest to what they look like in nature. Yeah. And yeah. I often talk about shopping from the outside edge of the supermarket because that's generally where you're going to get most of those things. When you start going up all the aisles, that's where all your package stuff is, right? And then yeah. you a lot more careful. And even stuff like um, I remember I was just talking to some women today actually about how sneaky companies can be with their advertising. Like I remember once I couldn't get the popcorn brand that I usually get for the kids and I was like, oh, I'll grab this one. It's like natural. It was green and blue and looked like really nice. Then when we opened it, Cooper's like, mummy, this popcorn tastes weird. And then I looked, it had sugar all through it. And you think you're doing the right thing, grabbing the, the natural branded thing. But if you don't read the ingredients on the back, you really just don't know what you're putting into your body, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and not all, to mention if you're buying processed packaged foods, you also have to take the bins out more. <laughs> totally. Absolutely. It's so true. Um, okay, so our group, our, our whole concept with Thrive Tribe & Co is all about self-care because we spend so much of our lives focusing on, you know, the additional needs of our children and everybody else that often we get left to last. So how do you, as a mum of a child with autism prioritize self-care in your day-to-day -day? look it's not easy um it's often not easy to do trying to balance you know family life work life my days are very hectic but self-care really for me is putting on that oxygen mask before i help others so if it's you know taking a pause arriving early to school pickup and sitting in the car for five minutes and listening to a meditation or even just sitting there, closing my eyes, not looking at my phone. Um, Self-care, yeah, can be as simple as that. And I think it's just finding little pockets throughout the day where you kind of consciously, um, you know, try and reduce your cortisol levels, um, you know, taking deep breaths, doing um, either alternate nasal breathing or, um, you know, breathing in for four seconds, holding it for four seconds and breathing out for four seconds and doing that four times has been shown to reduce your stress hormones. So, yeah, I would love to say, oh, self-care for me is, you know, going off on the weekend and having a massage and doing a yoga class, but that's just not... <laughs> it's fine, like, small pockets throughout the day. <laughs> totally. Well, and I think those, you know, whilst massages and weekends away are great, it's more about the daily practice, isn't it? If we're really going to look after our bodies and manage stress levels, it's not about getting a massage. It's about how do we consistently help our body cope with stress, not just in firsts, you know, have those, yeah. have those massages or weekends. Um, so I know you're a big advocate for herbs and because you're a herbalist. So what are your favorite herbal remedies for stress? Because I know there's lots out there and adaptogens mm -hmm. are like the new buzzword. I actually just did a post about this on my Facebook. But um, yeah, what are your what are your top tips around this? Yeah, so obviously it's um, individualized. And how I work as a herbalist is I will do a combination of herbs for people. It's not just sort of one size fits all. Um, but, um, I am a big fan of withania and I know ashwagandha is probably one of like the buzziest adapt adaptogens at the moment. Um, I particularly like withania for, um, a number of reasons. It helps to reduce stress. Um, it's also quite good in autoimmune diseases. So particularly in, um, autoimmune thyroid conditions. Um, it just helps to build resilience and I sort of see it as a herbal hug. Um, but there are others as well. Some of the ginsengs are really helpful, like Siberian ginseng or Korean ginseng. Um, I see Korean more suitable for men. Um, Siberian is more for, um, say you've got low immunity. Siberian ginseng will also be quite good to help um, with immunity. Um, I'm trying to think what else there is. Shisandra is a particularly good one for women. Um, 
it's an adaptogen. It's also a female tonic. Um, it's also good for the liver. Um, licorice is a good one, but not good for people with high blood pressure. So it's, I mean, it's so individualized, um, these herbal medicines. Um, Zizifus is a great adaptogen. It's also quite good for anxiety and stress. Um, but yeah, there's so, so many and it's so individualized. But, um, and now there's a whole range of mushrooms that you can get as well, like cordyceps, which is really good for um, uh, improving resilience in stress, but also um, immunity and boosting energy. So I'm actually, yeah, I'm a big fan of cordyceps at the moment. Um, because it does a whole mushroom? heap of stuff. Yes, it's mushroom. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah a medicinal, a medicinal mushroom. I think, yeah. So if ad adaptogens are kind of buzzy at the moment, the next kind of up and coming thing are these medicinal, um, medicinal mushrooms. Mm. Not not the yeah. magic ones, just medicinal. Not ma yeah, just me <laughs> just medicinal mushrooms. <laughs> oh. Well, you're but yeah, there's so there's so many. Um, herbs to support adrenal function um but yeah like i said it's so individualized it's so um tricky to say you know i have lots of favorites <laughs> sorry i'm just gonna make sure everyone's muted just so we get a really good recording are you kidding there we go are you still unmuted Brittany? um yeah. can you hear gotcha. me yeah. yeah gotcha okay. um and i think the thing with these herbs is this is how I understand it they're a preventative we shouldn't be waiting until we've absolutely lost the plot to then start using things like this because it's all about supporting your body before you get to the brain explosion part right yeah that's true I mean I, I think especially when you're going through periods of stress I would support yourself with either these herbs or magnesium or even vitamin C is quite helpful. Vitamin yeah. C is highly concentrated in the adrenal glands. So if we want them to work properly, we need to um, have additional vitamin C. Yeah. Um, but I don't think we should be taking these things long term. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, if you address the underlying problems, mm -hmm. of course, you're going to have acute phases of stress. You know, something's going to be happening at work or with your child or in home life. And I think, these remedies can definitely support you through that yeah i don't think you should be taking them long 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 term yeah because obviously those you know you need to be working on that self-care and making sure you're getting enough sleep and um so it's more about know. balancing out and getting your body back to equilibrium yeah. yeah yeah it's about balance yeah awesome and okay so i know that we're going to move into cheryl talking a little bit about sleep so as a little segue, what are some remedies that you found that are effective for sleep with children? Yeah, so this is the million dollar question, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know, if you could give everyone the answer, you and Cheryl, you can solve the sleep problems of the world the today, that would be amazing. The ma magic the magic bullet. I wish I had the magic the million dollar magic bullet. So um with kids, I often focus on gut health and I know a lot of people go, Why you know, I came to you for advice on, you know, helping to get my child to sleep. Why are you giving me advice on how to improve gut health? And that's because ninety percent of your serotonin is made in your gut. Serotonin is the precursor to melatonin, which is what is secreted um, by the pineal gland. Um, to induce sleep at night. So when we, we aren't exposed to light and we've got dark at a certain time of night, that melatonin will be secreted. So that's why I focus on um, gut function because of those precursors. Um, I also make sure that we've got adequate um, nutrient status of all the cofactors that help to make serotonin and melatonin. And those cofactors are iron and zinc, which I see a lot of um, iron deficiency anemia in kids, particularly kids with additional needs. Um, you can usually pick iron deficiency. They'll have um, dark, um, you know, dark circles under their eyes. And if you open their eyelids, they're quite pale. Um, obviously getting a blood test would be the best thing, <laughs> but that's not always possible in all of these kids. Um, I mean, getting a blood, getting bloods out of my son is like wrestling a crocodile. Yeah. So it's not going to happen sometimes. Yeah. Looking for those visual cues and then zinc, you can often spot zinc spots on their fingernails. There'll be white little spots mm -hmm. so that can be an indicator of zinc status. Um, so other nu nutrients that help with, um, as a cofactor are calcium and magnesium. 
So again, those magnesium bars or magnesium creams um, before bed can be helpful. Um, and then there's one other nutrient called L-theanine, which is interestingly found in um, green tea. So obviously we're not giving them the caffeine component of green tea. It's the L-theanine, which can aid in restlessness um, during the day. So it can be helpful in sort of ADHD um, um, or hyperactivity um, instances, but also um, at night to, yeah, reduce anxiety and um, aid in sleep. But that's, yeah, you know, there's obviously, you know, individual, nothing beats individual advice. That there oh. are specific dosaging and, you know, ways to source these things. So if anyone wants, you know, specific individual advice, I highly recommend reaching out um, and I can point you in the right direction. Beautiful. Yeah. So thank you so much, Brittany, for joining us today. We really appreciate you. And if anyone wants to check out more of what Brittany does, her website is wholefoodhealing.com.au and on Instagram, she is at wholefoodhealing and I will post that with the um, recording as well. So you've got all the links. But thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate you sharing your expertise. Thanks, Sandy. And I'm going to stay on so I can listen to Cheryl's yeah, advice. Some chips on sleep, <laughs> hey. <laughs> Thanks, Brittany. All right. So up next, we have Cheryl, who is known as the sleep coach. And I know everyone is really excited to hear from Cheryl. So I might let her share a bit about her story first. So Cheryl, um, did you just want to share a bit about how you become like the sleep coach? Where did your journey really start with, with sleep and being interested in this area? Well, hi, everybody. I feel so privileged to be talking to your group. Um, my journey started, I would say, about, well, in 1980. It was the 30th of May in 1980. Let me go back a step. Sorry. I was, I've got two beautiful boys and I was pregnant and went to the doctor, had my scan and they said I had one beautiful, healthy boy. So I was so excited. At 32 weeks, I had my next scan, which explained why I was carrying so much water and putting on so much weight and everything was happened. And the doctor said to me, there are two. I said, no, and I never looked. I thought, you're not catching me on this one. So I didn't look. Anyway, I then went into the room and he explained the scan and he said, it makes sense why you were having so much edema. Anyway, to cut a long story short, going home, I was so excited. It was one of the happiest days of my life. I thought, I'm going to have twins. How blessed am I, or we, all of us. Anyway, the next day I went into labor. So now I'm just over 32 weeks and I say I'm so excited and the doctor says, no, you're not. We've got to try and hold this off. Anyway, with a, just 32 and a half weeks, I delivered these two little boys and they went straight into special care and we were so excited. We had these boys and we were called into the ICU unit and they said, the one little boy has got a heart defect and we've got to move him across to another hospital. This was in South Africa. Shortcut everything. His name was Mark and the other twin was Clive. So they went to different hospitals, but eventually they were both in ICU at a children's hospital where they told me they would have to move Mark because he's got to have open heart surgery. Now, he wasn't even a kilo, so they had never done open heart surgery on a little boy so small. Anyway, they did it, and it was successful, and he went back to the special care, and for six and a half months, we traveled backwards and forwards to see this little boy. And Clive came home, who was just the sweetest, most special little baby. So I was juggling my two older boys who were, um, there was four years between all of them. So it sort of went up. So 
Larry was eight, um, Gavin was four, and then the twins were born. And we ran backwards and forwards. Eventually, the nursing sister said, Cheryl, you've got to slow down. You've got to take it easy. You've got to what, go away for a weekend. Can you hear? It's, yeah. Anyway, we didn't. And it was six and a half months later when we got that phone call to say little Mark just could not fight off his, um, he had pneumonia and he passed away. And of course we had this beautiful little boy who helped us get over everything. Not that we got over it, but you know, we focused on him. And my husband at the time said, you know what? These boys are so special, let's put a swimming pool down, which we did. And, you know, he said, what's life all about? Let's enjoy it. And we put a swimming pool down. I then went, it was now fast forward two and a half years. I went to work and I got a phone call to say, come home quickly. There was somebody looking after Clive and he drowned. Mm. So at two and a half years, Clive passed away. And I remember walking in and saying to them, don't bring back a vegetable. My family have been through enough. Anyway, he went in and he was, they sort of kept him alive a while and then said he was brain dead. So I now had two little boys that had been through two terrible traumas my whole focus was to protect them from anything I possibly could. So my whole focus was these two little boys. We then left South Africa and immigrated here 33 years ago. And again, I had a desperately unhappy husband who had immigrated. I had children that were now in a new country. So again, my focus was the children. Today, fast forward, I have five beautiful grandchildren and my two boys are very happily married. One has got three children, one has got two. But when my first grandchild was born, I walked out and thought to myself, what's going on here? And the nursing sister walked out and said, if only these mothers knew how important sleep was. She has no idea what's going to happen when she gets home. So I walked home, I got home and started research to find out how much focus is there actually on sleep. And there was so little. Mm. And that's when my journey started. I went um, via online. In America, I then studied at um, Edinburgh University in Canada, also online, and started then and realized how important it is that there is no real focus on sleep, which is what I needed going through the loss of two children. So, what did the doctors do? Give me medication. Mm. that medication didn't get to the bottom of why I wasn't sleeping so what used to happen which is a funny thing I used to bake because I couldn't sleep so I would get up so my deep freeze was popping with biscuits and everything because there was no focus that my body needed to recover and the only way I could recover was by sleeping yes so that's how my journey started and seeing so many parents with so many struggles with their children and themselves not sleeping. Totally. And so today I have an autoimmune disease, which is caused from lack of sleep. So yeah, the yeah. importance is that. Totally. And, um, Look, this is a topic that comes up, I would say, almost daily in our, in our community page um, with, you know, sleep, not only with, with the children, like, I mean, that comes up every day, but also with the parents. And we know how important, like, sleep is in that. That's when our body 
repairs and restores and and where we get what we need to be able to get up the next day, day and deal with all these stresses so look I've sent you through all the questions that that we got that we got asked and we've what Cheryl has done has sort of condensed it because lots of them were similar so we're going to go try and answer it all through through asking some common questions so look we know that children with additional needs often have challenges with falling asleep and staying asleep so um, can you give us say your four top tips around you know falling asleep staying asleep with these kids okay so I want to in before I even start I want to stress that these four top tips are for children with special needs children naughty children good children great parents ordinary parents any parents all adults okay it applies to all of Everybody. us Everybody. Yeah. but with children with challenges we've got to work a little harder at it okay my four tips are sleep window consistency drowsy but awake and routine sleep window is from the time we feel tired to the time we overtired so from the time that melatonin has been released to the time that the uh, hormone called cortisol is released, which acts as adrenaline, which anybody finds difficult to unwind and go to sleep. So if we get that good, right sleep window, we'll get there. Children, their biological clock is roughly 6.30. Our biological clock, meaning adults, is about 10.30. If you watch yourself at 10.30, you'll see you will dip, but then we push through. So we then start getting overtired. And I'm talking 6.30, um, 10.30. Obviously, that's not set. It's round about half an hour, three quarters of an hour either way. So that's our sleep window. Get your sleep window. It's like a surfer that catches the wave and we slide in easily. The next one is drowsy but awake. That's for the people that maybe will read in front of the TV, fall asleep, and then crawl into bed. So they're not completely awake. For the children, those that we maybe rock, that we hold, that we bounce on balls, or we feed to sleep, we then put them down. That's not drowsy. Okay, that's asleep. So what happens with those children or people when we come out of a sleep cycle, we want to call that person back to do what they were doing. So we haven't taught them to actually self-settle themselves, which is what we want to do. Children's sleep cycles are about 45 minutes. Our sleep cycles are 90 so ideally, what we want them to do is link their sleep cycles together. Now, we need everybody to go into proper sleep cycles because there's REM and non-REM sleep, but there's four different cycles that we need to go through. So we need to get into that deep sleep in order for the growth hormone to be released for our body to be repaired, for our brain to be repaired. Those different sleep cycles are ultimately important for us to get into. Now, when we fall into bed exhausted, we are not getting into a proper deep sleep. So we need our children to learn how to self-settle so they can get into a deep sleep. So that's that drowsy but awake. The next one is routine, which is key, especially for children. And especially, especially for children with special needs. Now, children with special needs, some of them really know how to play us. We want to do anything to help our children. We don't want to see them suffer or battle or whatever, but sometimes we need tough love. Sometimes we've got to show them they can do it instead of doing it for them. Now, there's one important thing for us to know. The only thing 
we cannot do for our children is sleep. We can do anything else for them, but we cannot sleep for them. So we need to teach them to be able to sleep for themselves. Okay, and that self settles. So an ideal routine I'll go through, it may change slightly, is first dinner, then we bath. If you bath every night, if you bath or shower, if you don't shower or bath your child every night, I would like you to change them into their sleepwear, whatever it is. So there is a difference in what's happened. So dinner, bath, shower. If they're still at the stage where they have milk, I would like that given out their bedroom or out the area that they sleep in. We then take them into their rooms. If they have a sleeping bag, put the sleeping bag on and read them one story. Because it's at this stage that we see these budding lawyers come out because they like to negotiate just one more book, just one more book. But if we do the same thing every night, we eliminate all that. And know that that sleep window is very short. So if we're reading two, three, four books, what eventually happens is we tip them over into overtired. Then when we put them in bed, we have the, I'm thirsty, I need to go to the toilet, I'm hungry, my blankets have fallen off, I don't want to wear these pajamas, all the stories. So we eliminate all that by getting them to bed before they're overtired. Okay. Before we put them in bed, we hug, kiss, read, sing a song, say a prayer, do whatever, and then into bed. And they've got to know from that point, they've got to try and do it themselves. Okay, so the last point is consistency. Now that, I don't need to tell you because you've found out already, Whatever you do has got to be consistent. If you say no, it's no. It's not how many times must I ask you before mum's going to say yes. Okay? It's no. If it's no, it's no. If it's bedtime, it's bedtime. If there's no more books, there's no more books. So our routine has got to be consistent every night. The time may vary, but the consistency is the same. Yeah. And there's just been a question pop up in the question thread. So right. True has asked, can I ask how to get them to sleep in their own bed? So if okay. sleeping in their own bed is a problem, what are they, how do they do that routine? Quickly ask, how old is the child? Because that also makes a difference. I'll just see what she says. Okay. So how do we get them in? Again, being consistent is ultimately important. So we put them in their bed and if they've got a doona, we let them pull it up. If they've got a heavy blanket because they've got a sensory, you know, problem or challenge, we do whatever and we try and make them do it. So we say to them and we practice and play a little bit before. So hop into bed, pull the blanket up. If it's a child that can't pull the blanket up, you do it, okay? But we want them to take ownership of what they're doing. We then tell them they may not get out of bed. So for that child that is getting out of bed, and as I say, I don't know the age. So uh, it's, you just responded, nearly eight. Nearly eight, okay. So he clearly can understand when we say you're not getting out of bed, they're not getting out of bed. So for the first couple of nights, maybe it's going to be necessary for the mum to sit just outside the door. And as she sees the child start getting up, she just uses simple words like no or stay in bed, not engaging in long, just short instructions 
so the child knows that's what they've got to do. And when they get out of bed, the mum must walk them back, but not hold hands, not pick up and carry. So what you do is put your hand at the back of their back and help them walk back, okay? Because a lot of these things are crutches. So they do it to have control. And what we want to do is take back control because any child thrives on discipline. So they need guidelines. So bedtime is bedtime. That's their bed. And the main bed is for mom and the partner. And that's it. So everybody's got to know they have their own space and their own bed. Okay, okay great. I hope that's helpful for her. I think so. Brittany, did you have a question? Yes, I've got a question. So what about in the middle of the night, if they come into your room? Is the, the middle of routine? the night, the middle of the night, you say, let's go back to bed, make them walk themselves, let them hop into bed. And if they can say, pull your blankets up and lie down. Okay, it's time to sleep. This is your bed. That's my bed. Okay, and a good way is I spoke to a sleep lady and she said, so blame me, it's absolutely <laughs> fine. <laughs> she said, you have to sleep in your bed and mum has to sleep in her bed. You, she is not allowed to, I always do the reverse, mum is not allowed to sleep in your bed. She's not allowed and you're not allowed in hers. Okay, so okay. the emphasis is on his. And then add in and yours. <laughs> okay. Beautiful. And I think this is probably a perfect time for you to talk to us a little bit. I know you've, you've said um, about that basic sleep routine, but what about setting up those habits and rituals before bedtime? Is there like some tips around things we should do, things that we should eliminate in that lead up to bedtime? Definitely. We definitely want to eliminate any super hyper play. I would love you, if possible, to switch off all screens between half an hour and an hour before bedtime because those blue lights, and depending what the children are actually watching, gets their brain moving and working again. And that's not what we want. So if we can rather do building or if you feel another book would be good, rather read another book out the room before you go in the room. In the room is only one book, that's it. So we want to try and keep away from anything that's going to super hype them up. Or stimulate them. Definitely, mm. no stimulation, nothing, just simple play. But usually by the end of the day, and once they've had their dinner, you're already winding them down. Yeah. So um, it's much better to have a, you know, slow bedtime, but it shouldn't go on for too long because we don't want to miss the thing over into yeah. overtired. Yeah. Mm, very and, important. Okay. So ideally then, what should their sleep environment look like? Okay. So sleep environment should be their safe haven. So first of all, obviously, if children are getting out of bed, we want to make sure that it is safe. But when I talk about safe haven, we want them to feel that it's okay to go there. So whatever they like, if they like blue, let's give them blue sheets or blue whatever. Let's find what they really like. If need be, let them come with you to choose something that they can have in their room. If possible, if toys and things like that are away, because that just stimulates thinking they want to play. We would like it to be dark because then we know that um, they know that it's time to, to um, go to bed. Some children are scared of the dark and nightlight is not a problem not a problem at all. So you have to find out what your child is comfortable with. Just one point that um, I want to bring up that um, Brittany did mention 
you know, the serotonin and melatonin being released. This is a very, very important thing. And some, depending what the special need is, some children have a problem producing melatonin. And the way we can help that naturally is by them playing outside so we can adjust the circadian rhythm so we can get that working which then helps the biological clock know that you know night time is coming so if we can get a little bit of outside play that will be good if they're going to do gym we don't want any you know gym and things like that just before bedtime we want that earlier in the day which will help them and um, Brittany did mention, which is very important, um, if the child is lacking in those few um, areas as iron and magnesium and zinc and things like that, it would be great if we could get, you know, get it naturally. Um, there's some children that have to take melatonin. I'm not a great believer in it unless we've tried natural things because it is still a hormone. Yep. So there could be natural things that we could do it. So getting back to the room, keeping it safe, keeping it, you know, sort of muted so that they know that that is their sleep. And some of them need heavy blankets. Some need to be, you know, wrapped. Whatever yep. is right for your child is the way to go yeah and you know what i think the thing with sleep it's not there's no silver bullet and everyone's so different and i think sometimes people are looking for the answer but um you know what i've sort of discovered over the past few years is usually it's a combination of things so what we do with imogen is she has a magnesium bath we use a couple of essential oils that i've found work really well with her she gets into her pajamas last night she grabbed my hand and said mommy no nice and i put it to bed and that's just, she's developed that because she knows that this is the progression of the night. She actually that's watches it. the clock for it because she's very motivated by the time, right? So, and, but that's not something that happens overnight either. No, it's, no. it's something that you have to practice and it's again about, about being consistent, right? Mm. Okay. Um, there's a question. What about eye herb melatonin versus compressed prescription melatonin? Is there a difference or would one be better? I'm not going to comment on that. No, that's probably no. a doctor question. It is. I can mean, I, I have, I have my I opinion, in? but I'm happy for Brittany too, rather than me. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, in Australia, melatonin, um, you have to get it prescribed by um, a pediatrician or a GP. So you're much better off getting that script um, from them. Um, and I mean, that's what we do for my son anyway, and they will make it up in a suspension. Basically, if you're buying and buying off iHerb or through any of those US sites, you're just bypassing that um, restriction in Australia, which I don't think is such a good thing. No. Things that are sold on iHerb aren't regulated, and oftentimes you don't know, you know, what you're buying is actually what you think you're buying. Um, Australian standards, the TGA, um, are much stricter on our supplements in Australia versus um, FDA in america so i would go through your doctor if you want melatonin get it on prescription get it compounded get it made cool that's all yeah Bye. but also um in saying that as as we said there are some children that actually have to have the melatonin because they're not producing it then definitely they need there are there could be other things involved as well so they do need their doctor that's the first thing. And secondly, even with melatonin, they've got to go through those four key steps of getting to sleep because the melatonin, if they're running around, is still not going to work. Yeah. So we've got to do the two together anyway. Yeah. All right. And then the, I think our last one is what about so the, the impact of lack of sleep? So I, and I'd love to talk about this generally because I think it's, it's not only the children this is impacting, no. it's the parents, usually more no. than, the, than the children. A hundred percent. It is so important to the extent that I now talk at corporate level 
because people just don't think about it. It's always the thing that we push aside, but don't realize the impact that it has. So um, it does affect everybody. Our overall health most definitely is affected. We know that it causes obesity. Um, we know that there's depression, hyperactive, um, because you can't relax. Um, aggression comes out of it. Um, there's obviously increased behavior problems. And, well, there's irritability. And with children, you've got poor learning and cognitive performance. But in saying children, that's not so. In adults as well, you get poor performance when you're not sleeping. And why, how it affects yourself as well as yourself in the workforce is incredible. Do you know that there's more deaths on the road or there's more deaths caused by micro sleeps than there is from drugs and alcohol? So that's how important it is that we actually do get our sleep. Absolutely. All right, so we've gone a little bit over time, but I think it was totally worth it. Um, and I'm glad a couple of questions got answered and asked on the call. So if you um, want to check out more about what Cheryl does, she's at CherylTheSleepCoach.com.au um, and I've got her email and phone number that I will post on the um, recording along with that as well. So um, you guys can all have Brittany and Cheryl's details. So thank you, Cheryl, for sharing your expertise with us today. Thank you. Awesome. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. We've loved having you on here. Um, I will upload this recording soon. So if you have someone that you know that might like to check it out, we would love you to share it with them. Um, as I said, this is part of what we do every month with our Inner Circle members. So they get, the, they get access to these experts consistently. So each month we have a different expert come on and we talk about different topics. Today was a special one. You had two, which was really cool. And we talked about two different topics. Um, um, but if you'd like to hear more about our Inner Circle program, reach out to Steph Wicks or myself and we can totally fill you in. But thanks again for joining us today and we will see you next time. Thanks, Brittany. Thanks, Cheryl. Thank you. Bye.